Okay, well I'm here with a man who uh, needs no introduction, usually does the introductions in fact, Rob Walker, MC extraordinaire and broadcaster, how are you keeping? Very good, thanks, good to be here at the Sports Spiritual Home, there's no finer place in the world to be at this time of year than at the Crucible and we've got just less than a week to go, it's been brilliant so far and it looks like we're bubbling towards a fantastic conclusion to an event that just keeps on delivering and never fails to shine. I'm, uh, I'm curious because I've, this is only my third time at the Crucible uh, covering it for the World Snooker Championships and I usually only do three or four or five days necessarily but, but you've done, you do the 17 days and not only that but your introduction, introducing every single session. Do you ever get sick? When was, your, when was your, the last session that you missed or, or managed to not introduce because it's, it's a slog, it's, it's, not, it's not easy on your body I'd imagine. Well, you, you have got to remember that it's a marathon, not a sprint. I think when I was young, free and single and coming up here, I think I was going on the lash every other night. But by the time I got to about day eight or nine, I quickly realised that was a very, very bad idea. So, yeah, you really do have to pace yourself because it's not just the 17 days. Judgment Day has now become almost as popular in its own right as, as the 17 days of action at the Crucible because to come through that final round and finish their season here as opposed to in a car park at the English Institute of Sport makes a massive difference. So you add on a week at the front for Judgment Day and then I stay for the seniors afterwards. I'm up here for a month. When I checked into the hotel, she said, how many nights are you with us, sir? I said, at 28. She thought I was joking. So yeah, listen, you, you've got to pace yourself. But the thing is, every time you walk out in, fr in front of those people, it's, it is a privilege because the very reason these snooker players first picked up a cue was to, at one point or another in their lives walk down those stairs they had two goals one one is to get here and be introduced mm. not by me just to be introduced at the crucible and then the second goal is to win the title so if you happen to be in the position where you are the one uh, trying to ensure that they get a reception they deserve then you need to make sure that you're not hung over when you turn up and that you say what you mean and you try and deliver it with as much gusto and a little smattering of cheese here and there with the nicknames. Some go down well, some don't. But, but yeah, you, you've got to pace yourself, but it never gets boring. I mean, it would do if you did it 365 days a year, but we're only up here for a month every year. And, and it's, it's our, this is our window to the world. And we, everybody working backstage has got to play their part in making sure that through that window, this sport shines to as many people as possible. So, yeah, you never get bored. It, it is tiring, but you just got to pace yourself. Those walk-on moments are, are just extraordinary. And, and I, the nicknames you mentioned, I know you were quite significant in, in Neil Robertson's Thunder from Down Under nickname and, and Sean Murphy probably approached you at one point to, to he did, have yes. his nickname changed. So it, it's a little thing that people don't realise goes on behind the scenes, maybe. Well, look, most of the nicknames I inherited when I started in 2007, but you are right. My first tournament, the UK Champs in Telford, Sean Murphy took me aside and said, look, they're calling me some kind of warrior from Earthlingborough or somewhere like that. And he said, I'm not, I'm not really a warrior. How about we change it to the magician? Because when I'm half decent, I can make the balls disappear. So I said, mate, I'll, I'll use whatever nickname you want. So the magician seems to have stuck. Of course, the Rocket Ronnie was already established, the Wizard of Wish or the Welsh Potting Machine. But yeah, Neil Robertson's was one that, I mean, I think I said to him, look, how about we change it up a bit? If I can come up with something half decent that alludes to the fact that you're Australian, what about the thunder from down under? And he went, yeah, that sounds good. So the very nature of nicknames means that some of them are cheesy and I accept that. But yeah, Rob Robbo's is one that you can really get your lips around and you can stretch the words out. Would you please welcome the thunder from down under, Neil? So you can space that out a bit and, and kind of get into it. I, rem I remember a great clip. Uh, it must be from a few years ago now of you, of you uh, a bit of a tongue-in-cheek clip of you practicing the Ronnie O'Sullivan walk-on from your from your hotel hotel room. And, oh yeah. But it's one of those moments. Like I, I was in the auditorium for the for the Fafai walk-on the other day, and th there's just something electric about the moment that Ronnie O'Sullivan walks out and, and you do that introduction. It just it feels different. It feels like everyone's already cheering before before you've even introduced his name. Oh, you 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 could stand there in a deadpan voice and go. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Ronnie O'Sullivan. And the whole place would, would go off. I mean, what, what helps at the moment is that you really don't need many statistics for Ronnie. He's the reigning champion. He's the world number one. He's the greatest player in history. I mean, you know, if you're introducing someone, you know, goat, world number one, reigning champion. That is about as good as it gets. The only thing you'd insert into that, which I did today, was just reminding people that today happens to be 
uh, yet another record for O'Sullivan that he's he's taking part in his 100th Crucible match. Mm. So if something really significant like that is involved, then I might add that in as an extra line. But you need very little with Ronnie. You just need to make sure that what you do deliver for him, you do with huge gusto. Because the contrast, uh, you know, otherwise, the, the, the contrast between a solo voice saying his name and a whole stadium of people erupting is, 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 quite, is, is quite handy and sort of helps to sell the sport at home. So, yeah, introducing Ronnie is, is pretty straightforward because all you've got to do is light the match. The crowd does it all themselves. 100%. And, and there, was a, there was a moment in the, the World Championships this year that, that has picked up headlines, even walking through the corridors there. You can see the newspapers up on the, on the wall, the, uh, the orange powder, oh, I guess yeah. we would call it, the dry paint or whatever it was. But yeah. uh, you, were, you were quite busy, so not just an MC or a broadcaster, but you were... Um, you were seen hoovering up uh, some of that orange powder off the table. What, how did this all come about? I was commentating on that match with John Parrott. TV were focusing on the other table. So we were going out on the red button and, and various platforms. But the second table is normally turned around and used for highlights. Or when the, when the main table is on a mid-session interval, they'll say, oh, let's catch up with what's happening on the other side of the arena with, with Joe Perry and Rob Milkins. You know, Rob Walker and, and John Parrott are overseeing that one. So we were just going through the early stages of the first frame and then all of a sudden it, it just happened and it took two or three seconds for John Parrott and I to, to actually compute what we were seeing because it was, it, was, it was mind-blowing. Anyway, once we got instructions from the director to, to take a pause, we said, look, you know, there's obviously going to be a, a min, a, at minimum a significant delay to the action here. We will go off and find out what's going on. Please, please bear with us in, in terms of your patience. So then I switched back into my other role as an MC because I needed to find out what was going on so that I could let the crowd know, mm. are they, is, the play, is the play being suspended? Is it being stopped overnight? Where are we? So I went out and gave an update according to tournament director Mike Ganley. And then it was a case of all hands to the pump. A lot of people busy trying to sort various things out. Some people were trying to work out where the crowd were going to wait you know got hundreds and hundreds of people so it's logistically difficult and then I could see everybody trying to get the paint off the table and I just I was out there oblivious to the fact that television cameras were still rolling because I thought they'd just cut either to archive footage or they'd, or they'd gone back to studio chat so I said is there another hoover because we need as many people on this as quickly as possible to get it done so I just started hoovering the side of the table and then I stopped momentarily because I got shouted at by one of the security guys to say, look, we still don't 100% know what that is. So if you're by the table, you better put a mask on and rubber gloves. So I think that added to the comedy value. Uh, I said, oh, OK. So I put the gloves on, I put the mask on and then I was hoovering the table and I had no idea that it was being filmed. I was, it was just a case of there was a spare hoover and it was all hands to the pump. And then obviously afterwards, I, I started getting bombarded with messages from people I know who don't watch snooker saying, apparently you're hoovering the table at the crucible. What's going on? And then I realized, okay, okay, this, is, this has been seen by a lot of people. And the, and the reason was that when Eurosport went back to their studio, Radzi, a Chinyang guy had a presenter, was talking to Jimmy White, and then Jimmy recognized me and said, oh my God, what, Rob Walker's hoovering the table, what's going on? And then, and then it went viral, I think. So yeah, that was quite strange, but Thankfully, all was sorted. Hopefully, it'll never happen again, but it will most certainly never, ever be forgotten. It was a moment that you just couldn't compute that it was actually unfolding in front of your very eyes. It was quite an incredible incredible viral moment as soon as the clips started doing the rounds on Twitter I was like what what is going on here there was another viral moment many people watching and, and listening to this will, will know your voice from other and your face from other things the Olympics and the Paralympics and I know in, in the Tokyo Olympics um, there was quite a moment where you were commentating on one of the Ugandan athletes and you were very complimentary of, of the country and of mm. the people and of, of Uganda generally uh, uh, judging by social media that led to a bit of a, a trip for yourself to, to Uganda last month I mean that must be quite incredible and it shows the length that broadcasting can go to as well that, that people in Uganda just appreciated their country being recognised the Ugandan scenario was was really humbling because you're quite right I, I, I've commentated and I've worked on every Olympic game since Athens in 2004 probably why I look so old <laughs> compared to you um, and I've, I've been a fan of East African distance running for many many years running is the, the only sport I was ever any good at and I still run regularly now it's how I de-stress and and I just I I'm never at my I'm never happier apart from being with my friends and family I'm never happier than when I am in motion 
on the country lanes around where I live, I live in a very rural place. It's, it's very pretty and, and, and it's a lovely place to run. And I can look at the birds and just be be at peace with nature. I never run with music. I like to I like to take in my surroundings and, and, and just feel quite relaxed. Anyway, so, so I've been going to Uganda for many years as a backpacker. Really like the place. I've, I've always had a great reception there. And I said that in, in commentary. I'm, I'm the lead international commentator. So people wouldn't really hear me in the UK because you'd be listening to Steve Cram and Andrew Cotter. But if you're watching the Olympic Games in any other English speaking country around the world who have not specifically sent their own commentators, you're listening to me. I don't say my name so people don't know who I am. But, but anyway, so yeah, the Ugandans had their best ever Olympic team. Um, Jacob Kiplimo is a young up-and-coming athlete who's been challenging and subsequently beating in the World Cross. Uh, Joshua Cheptegei, and they have a female a steeplechaser called Perith Chemitai. And Joshua and Jacob were running in the 10,000 metres, which was very early on in the athletics programme. And I, yeah, you're quite right. I said, you know, um, you know this, is, this could be a very, very special week for Ugandan athletics because we're used to talking about this great... East African rivalry between the Kenyans and the Ethiopians, but the Ugandans are in a position now where they might start to turn that into a triumvirate of excellence rather than just a two-way rivalry on the other side of the Rift Valley. So I mentioned that and I, and I said, you know, I've been to Uganda many times, very, very friendly place. If you've never been, you know, it's well worth a visit. The, the people are absolutely tremendous. And I, I said something like, if you're watching in Uganda, the source of the Nile, which it is, if you're up and down the banks of the uh, of the river in Jinja or you're in Kampala, Oliotia, which is a local dialect way of saying, how you doing? Uh, I, I hope your athletes go well. And then Joshua and Jacob got the silver and the bronze in the 10,000. Then Perith Chemitai won the steeplechase and she was the first Ugandan woman to become an Olympic champion. So that was a massive, massive deal for women and for Uganda. And then at the very end in the 5,000 metres, uh, Joshua Cheptegei got his gold uh, you know, over over the 12 and a half laps and basically I, I I ended up going viral in Uganda and I kept in touch with them and yeah I had I had a trip in February it was mind-blowing I met everybody finance ministers tourism ministers education ministers I wasn't involved in any politics but I'm, I'm all about education and tourism and sport I was taken to meet the president and loaned his helicopter <laughs> so on the 11 day tour I was flown around the country. I got an incredible insight into the natural geography of the place because obviously I was able to see more places in a helicopter than I had been mm. backpacking on a bus, jump going up and down like that for 15 hours to, to do a couple of hundred miles. So, yeah, the whole experience was, was absolutely amazing. Um, I'm now a, uh, um, a goodwill ambassador for Uganda because I think it's the African continent in general, and I know I'm talking about a vast swathe, of many different countries and cultures but I think people are still really frightened of going to the African continent and I've been going there for many many years and I've I've, I've never been threatened I've never felt unsafe I've always had a good time and I'm, I'm really keen that my son comes with me to Africa quite soon to uh, and probably to Uganda because I want him to experience an incredible continent you know there unfortunately I think there are still many many outdated views of Africa as a continent and on lots of individual countries. You know, when you think of Uganda, people talk about Idi Amin. Well, you know, that was in the early 70s. You've got to judge as you find. And I've been there many times and they're wonderful people. They made me they made me feel like I was a visiting dignitary. It was off the scale. So I'm going to go out of my way to, to try and spread the word and, and try and try and help their tourism because that, you know, tourism filters into restaurants, into hotels, into tour guides, into education, into... Um, you know, wildlife reserves, many, many different areas could benefit from that. So if I can play a small role in, in helping to, to make Western people realise that they could go there and have a very safe, very happy holiday, then, then, I, then I'm happy to do that. And, and the other thing to clarify is I've, I've told them that I never want to be paid for that because I only ever want to be saying things because I believe it, not because someone's stuffing a watch of $50 bills into my pocket. So whatever I say about Uganda, I say because I genuinely believe it. And I have never and will never be paid to be a tourism ambassador. It's something that I insist is done on a voluntary basis. So yeah, br brilliant place. It was a crazy experience. One of the most amazing I've ever had. 100%. And, and you'll, need, uh, you'll need bouncers and security guards yourself, no doubt, for all the selfies and autographs when you go back to Uganda the next time, uh, for sure. Uh, finally, Rob, uh, you've been great with your time. The, um, the one thing I've noticed at all of the sessions I've been to so far this year, 
you've been giving away a, a free pint to, to someone in the crowd or someone with, oh, with, yeah. with a worthwhile story. So this is it's something that's close to your heart, and I know you've you've had a lot of personal losses over the mm. la- over the last twelve months or, or, or more. Um, maybe explain to us what what that's all about, and and of course you're doing a a bit of a an arduous journey as well as part of the whole thing. Yeah, I am. I I, I didn't realise you were going to ask me about that, which is totally cool. Uh, basically, over a period of about twenty months, uh, three really good friends of mine died. Robin had a heart attack at home. Martin died in his sleep. Stephen had a brain tumour. And I decided after getting home from the crucible last year, I managed to get home the day before Stephen died. And the only crucible I've never enjoyed was last year because I knew Stephen was going and I was asking for text messages. People, I, I was asking his brother-in-law and I spoke to Ivan Hershevitz, who's the chief dog in the press room. And I said, look, Ivan, I might need to go. I'll only go for half an hour, but I might need to go and say goodbye to Stephen. And he went, yeah, that's fine. So I just kind of kept checking my messages every few days. And it must have really started to weigh heavily on me because I started to feel unwell last year. I had loads of tummy aches. My back was hurting me. I was so tired. I couldn't eat properly. I was in a hell of a state. It took every bit of my energy to, to get through the World Championships. And I only realised retrospectively it was, it was sheer stress because I was thinking about Stephen all the time. Mm. I'm wondering if I was going to get to say goodbye to him and, and when he was going to pass away. So, so I got home the day after I got back from the seniors last year. Um, Stephen died and, and I was privileged enough to, um, to sit with him for two hours and, and stroke his hand and, and, you know, and tell some funny stories and, and you know, just sort of be in his presence. Um, whether he was aware I was there, I, I don't know. But in the aftermath of that, I decided that I wanted to do something positive because I'd done eulogies at all three of their funerals and doing eulogies is bloody hard because you're having to you're having to dip into the well like right down the bottom of the well to to kind of understand your feelings and it it reinforces how much you loved those people and why you're going to miss them uh so I said to Ivan I said right I'm going to do John O'Groats to Land's End I don't know how I'm going to do it but I'm going to do it next year because June is a good month for me because I can you know save up a bit of cash from working on this because I'm self-employed if I then don't earn in June I'm okay because I've had the world championship so I said, would you, let, would you let one of your guys come and film it if, um, if, I, if I call in on some snooker players along the way? He said, yeah, no problem. So June the 5th, I'll be in John O'Groats. Uh, we've got a camper van. My dad's going to do the driving for Scotland. I've got two other mates. One's doing the north of England. One's doing the West Country. And we're going to, I'm going to cycle and run from John O'Groats to Land's End to raise money for the Jesse May um, Children's Hospice at Home, which is World Snooker Tour's mm. official charity, and the Brain Tumor Charity, because Steve, Stephen had a brain tumor. So I was always going to do it in memory of those three. And then very, very sadly, just before Christmas, one of my son's best friends died. He was nine, Arthur's nine as well. And George was a beautiful, beautiful little boy. Um, Arthur and him used to come around to our house quite often um, after school and... I think on a Thursday, they used to come around for bath night and they're just talking when they were four or five. And you'd go upstairs because, I mean, you look too young to have kids, but you, you have to keep your eye on children in a bath because you never know because they're not old enough. If one of them slips under, the other one thinks it's a joke. And anyway, so I always remember popping in occasionally, just being on that level of the house to make sure everything was fine and just hearing them squealing and laughing. And they used to do this thing where they got out of the bath and got dry and they used to bump. They used to um, bump belly buttons. Uh, they always used to squeal with laughter. So everybody really, really missed George. And it was, it was like, a, I mean, when, when a child dies, uh, George died in his sleep. So it was just a complete shock. When a child dies in a rural community like ours, the only way I can describe it, it's like a bomb of grief. Literally lands in the middle of the village and just goes, <laughs> And everyone is just completely stopped in their tracks. Plus, you're having to try and explain to a nine-year-old why his friend isn't there anymore. And if that's hard for a 48-year-old to compute that a nine-year-old could pass away, um, trying to get my son to understand what that meant was just about impossible. So so, so, so I'm now doing it in, in memory of George as well as Robin, Stephen and Martin. And um, yeah, I'm, 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 I've set myself a big target. I'm going to try and raise 25 grand, which I know, you know, I'm not a massive name. Uh, 12 and a half grand for Jesse May and, and 12 and a half grand for the Brain Tumor Charity. And, and I've, we, I've woven in the Ugandan element because I asked the Ugandans, would they put up, would they put up a holiday? And they said, well, do you mean for you? I said, no, 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 no. Would you put up a free holiday for a week to Uganda 
to go trekking with mountain gorillas, which is the sort of showpiece thing that you do if you're going to Uganda. And I did that in February. It's incredible. So everybody who donates will get one raffle ticket for every quid they throw in the kitty. And when I finished, I'm going to pull out a raffle ticket and someone is going to go on a free holiday to Uganda to go trekking with mountain gorillas. So, yeah, it's something I feel quite strongly about. You know, it's um, uh, when you lose mates. Martin was my housemate at uni. Stephen and I ran together, worked together for 15 years. Robin and I got friendly through snooker. When you lose mates, it takes a long time. Mates of your own age, especially if they've died suddenly, like uh, like Robin and, and Martin did. Yeah, when Martin died, I was like, uh, it was like someone punching me in the face. Um, I was at my son's birthday party, actually, my son's eighth birthday party. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, you, it, it, you never forget that moment. Um, but rather than making me, obviously I was, I mean, I can't tell you, with Martin specifically, because I was so shocked, I can't tell you how much I wept in the first week. Once, it was really strange, once a day, I'd be fine and then someone would talk to me about it and I would disintegrate for yeah. five minutes and then it would take me a little while to recompose. It only happened for about a week, but it was, I just couldn't get my head around the fact that I wasn't gonna see him again. So yeah, obviously I really miss those guys and Martin, you know, M Martin never never lived long enough to be a husband or, or, or a father. Um, Robin did and Stephen did and, and George is a completely different ball game. But yeah, I was really sad about that. However, it, it hasn't made me depressed. It's made me even more determined to be an upbeat character, to make the most out of life. Because weirdly, dying is a part of life. We're all going to die. But there's two ways you can react to that. You can sit around and go, oh, that's not very good, is it? Or you go, all right, well, I know that. So let's make sure that whatever time I've got left, I try and help as many people as possible and have as much fun as possible and limit how much the day-to-day -day annoyances of admin and Oh, remembering to pay council tax or whatever it might be that's winding you up you just let it go you just go doesn't matter in a year I'm not going to remember and there'll come a time where you know I might be in Stephen's position in a bed and I, might, I won't be thinking about bills I forgot to pay I'll be thinking about hopefully the people I've hugged the people I've loved the smiles the shared experiences so yeah the last sort of two years has has been hard but but it's made me um very determined to enjoy every single day. So I'm a bit nervous about the trip because my work schedule here is so heavy. Mm. I haven't had a chance to do as much training as I would have liked. But when I go home, I'm gonna go into beast mode for me. And um, I'll get there, I'll get there. Even if I have to get off and stop and rest, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty determined character. So you'd have to hit me in the face with a brick to stop me finishing that challenge, barring injuries. Well, it's a brilliant attitude and a, and a brilliant outlook, Rob. I'm sure people can follow follow it all on social media. I'm sure if, if they wanted to donate as well, that's the place to get you. Yes, yes, I completely forgot all about that. I haven't launched it on social media yet, but I will do in the coming days because I've been so busy commentating. It's it's going to be called, it's on Just Giving, and it's called Rob Walker's Absent Friends Tour. So you find me on Just Giving. I'll put it on my Twitter, which is at Rob Walker TV. I'm rubbish with social media. I have set up an Instagram page, but I've yet to post a tweet, but I will do, and I'll remember to check it. And yeah, and if I if I can get to twenty five grand, it would be absolutely amazing. Brilliant, Rob. Keep doing what you're doing, and uh, appreciate the time. As always, no, thanks no worries. Great stuff. Enjoy the rest of your time in Sheffield. Good to have the Irish here, as always.